Amen and amen and amen and amen. The songwriter says, glory to his name, glory to his name. Here to my heart was the blood applied. And then the songwriter goes on to sing glory to his name. I just want to take the time again just to greet you in the matchless name of Jesus. We serve a God that loves us. We serve a God that declared to us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We serve a God where, which and whereby, my God, if we have drifted far away from him and we turn and we decide to come home like we read in Luke chapter number 15 earlier with the story of the prodigal son, his arms are there and he will welcome you home. So I want to say to somebody out there who, my God, the devil may have been trying to convince you to stay away because God is going to point the finger and he's going to highlight and underscore what you have done wrong. I want to say that's the work of the devil. Why do you say that, preacher? Because the scripture tells me in Romans 8 and 31, no, therefore, there are no condemnation to them that are in Christ. So you come back in the fold, ask for forgiveness, and he's going to restore you to your rightful position, just like the father did the prodigal son. When we peer through the lens of that story, the son came and he had a lot to say to his father. But before he could even say anything, the actions of the father, my God, said to the son, I love you, and we can talk about this later. What if we would practice that? My God, somebody has done us wrong. A family member has drifted, and they have gone off in the distance, my God, because of their own um, mindset or their own belief, but they come to their senses and they begin to come back home. What if we would restore them to their rightful position, good God, and then we begin to have conversation about what didn't go right and what was supposed to and what didn't, you know, that would be a good thing. But we're going to pray. Father, we come before you this morning praying and asking that you will give us a heart like thine. This is what one songwriter say, Lord, give me a heart like thine. Give me a heart so I can look at things the way you look at it. Give me a heart so I can process things the way you process it. Give me a heart so that I can filter things the way you filter it, thereby doing so, God. I, my God, will remove me out of the picture. And because I remove me out of the picture, I will begin to see things the way you see it. Spirit of the living God, we come, we quiet our minds and our hearts. And we're asking you this morning, Father, to have your way. Have your way, O oh God, in our minds, in our hearts, in our thinking. Have your way this morning. Have your way. Have your way. You are the potter and we are the clay. The clay doesn't get to say to the potter, make me this or make me that. My God, we have come to the realization and the understanding that everything you create, you do two things with your creation. Number one, you give it a name. And number two, there's an assigned purpose, my God, to everything that you create. And what if we would take a step or two or three, four, maybe five step back, look at where we are today and ask ourselves the question, am I living according to my God ordained or God given purpose? And if not, my God, today would be a great day like any other, my God, to make a decision just to turn around and to come back to the Lord. I remember going to Sunday school, Lord, and this song is coming back to my mind. I was walking down the street and I wonder, I was walking down the street and I wonder how far I was from God. And the songwriter goes on to say that I buckle up my shoe, tie my laces, and I started to run away back home to you. Father, what if today is that day like the prodigal son? We come to our senses and we decide to come back home to you to live in and with the purpose that you have assigned unto us. Yes, we're getting ready to celebrate Memorial Day here in the States. And wouldn't this be a Memorial Day for us? My God, where we uh, remember where we were and we remember the decision that we make to come back to you. And so we're asking you to have your way in this service. Have your way in this service. My God, have your way in this service. Father, we look to you. And we say thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you again. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. I believe God's presence is here with us. I do have a lot to say because he has given me a lot to say. And I'm going to preach and teach my heart out this morning. That's what I just feel in the depths of my spirit, that I'm going to preach my heart out. Again, we're going to continue on the pathway that he has set before us in that he started this conversation asking us the question, who are you? He asked us, what is your brand? 
And then he wants to add to that conversation. What are you known for? So these are questions, my God, that uh, the Lord is, 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 is continuing to have with us. Who are you? Do you know who you are? What is your brand? What is your brand known for? And then the question is, what are you known for? Who are you? What is your brand? And what are you known for? Two passages of scripture we're going to look at. We're going to go to John chapter number one. We're going to start at 15. We have a lot of reading to do. And my God, we're going to jump and we're going to hop and we're going to skip, but everything will be aligned with what he has to say to us. John chapter number 15, and we're going to start at verse 15. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will start at verse 15. And it reads thus, it says, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this is he whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So John was the forerunner to Jesus Christ, tasked with the assignment, my God, to clear the way. So when Jesus come, my God, everything would be set and aligned for the message of salvation to be preached. Do you understand that God created you with a sense of purpose? And my question to you as we take our time going through the text, what if you were created to be the forerunner of an individual that is coming behind you and you are tasked with the assignment to be diligent, to be careful, to make sure you lay a foundation where, which, and whereby when the person who is coming behind you, my God, it is their turn to take over from, my God, where you left off. There will be connectivity. It won't be any gaps because you are diligent and dedicated, my God, to do that which you have been asked to do. I'm going to take my time this morning. Is that okay? John again bore witness of him, cried out, saying, This is he whom, my God, I said, who comes after me, is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received with grace for grace. My God, I like that. Grace. God's grace is sufficient for you and for me. I'm going to go back and I'll deal with that in a moment. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So they live under ah, the Mosaic law. There were 614 law that they have to keep. They have to commit them to memory. And that was the guideline we which and whereby they used to live out my God, their life. But when Jesus came, the law was abolished and then he simplified it in that he tells that, that everything, my God, comes down to love. Love your neighbor. Love, love. The Bible tells us that they will know us by our fruit. Who are you? You are known by the fruits, my God, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we know you based on the words that you speak. Verse 17 again, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through the Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is my God in the bosom of the Father, He was, He has declared Him. Ah, watch this. Now, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levite from Jerusalem to ask him. Who are you? So in other words, John were doing things that was declared and prophesied, and they looked, my God, at the works of John, and they thought that John was the Messiah. So they came and they asked him the question, who are you, good God? You see, this is a question that I've been asked throughout time. And if I were to ask you the question this morning, who are you? What would you, or how would you answer that? Or are you able to answer that question this morning? Who are you? Again, they asked John the question, John chapter number one, again in 19. Now, my God, this was the testimony of John when the Jews sent the priest and the Levite, the priest and the Levite, they had their established standard, where which and whereby they live. And when the evidence points to some of the standards that they have that are established, they move and they conclude that this has to be the Messiah because it was prophesied and we have documents underscoring and underlining that the Messiah would perform these things. John, again, was the forerunner for Jesus, went before and he was doing these things. And it is the things that he were doing, my God, that caused them to be inquisitive and ask the question, who are you? So again, the Levites, they sent the priests and the Jews, my God, from Jerusalem to ask him the question, who are you? 
he confessed and did not deny but confessed, I am not the Christ. I'm not the Christ. I'm the forerunner sent to go before him. And my God, what you see me doing, he is going to do greater things. And the question is, do you understand who you are? And if you understand who you are, ah, do you then operate or stay in your lane, as we would put it, my God, or are you venturing out and going into a lane, good God, we which and whereby, when you do that, you minimize the effect of what you have been called to do. John know who he was, and so John, if you will, was staying in his lane. He confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Watch this, and they ask him, what then are you, Elijah? He said, my God, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no, even though he were doing things that, that look prophetic and the prophecy of what was declared, he is walking in it. Good God. He asked the question, are you a prophet? And John declared, no, watch this. Then they said to him, who are you? It is a pressing question that you have to answer. I have to answer. John had to answer the question, and my question to you throughout the course of today is, who are you? What is your brand, and what are you known for? Watch this. And they said to him, who are you, that we may give an answer to those who send us? What do you say, good God, about yourself? I want to ask you the question based on what is in Scripture, not my opinion. What do you say about you? My God, what you have to say about you is important. And watch this. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, my God, as the prophet Isaiah said, 24. Now those who were sent, my God, were of the Pharisees. Uh, if, 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 if I have time, I'm going to talk about the five religious groups, my God, that were in the time of Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, my God, and there was another group. Uh, they will come to my mind and I will talk about it if I have time. If time permits, my God, I would preach about that. Whose, my God, were sent again from the Pharisees? And they ask him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answers, saying, I baptize with water. Watch this. Ah, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. The question is, how is it possible that Jesus can stand amongst you, but you do not know? Write this down if you're taking notes. Jesus. He is never recognized. He is revealed. We'll get to that in a moment. I want to take my time this morning because I feel like I'm going to teach this morning. Jesus Christ, he's never recognized, but he's always revealed. Because my God, if it was possible that systems that they have in place would have pointed to Jesus when he come, my God, the systems that they have and the boxes that they have to check, he did not fit the mold. So Jesus, he's never recognized. He's always revealed. You have to receive divine revelation to know what is of Christ and what is not. That's why the Spirit, that's why the Bible say to us, not in John here, but when you read John 1, 2, and 3, it says that we ought to try or we ought to test the Spirit, good God, and you will know if it's of God or if it's of not. That's not my teaching this morning, but I just want to bring those awareness to us this morning. John answers saying unto them, I baptize with water, but they won't stand of, 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 of so, so let me read that again. I baptize with water, but there, but there stand one among you whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me. My God is preferred before me. So notice John didn't have a problem with the fact that he was the forerunner for Christ and Christ was coming and he was going to do greater works. You see, sometimes we get caught up in ourselves, my God, and like the disciples walking down the street of Emmaus, we begin to argue amongst ourselves, who is the greatest amongst us? The question is, if we're all tasked to do a particular task, my God, why am I measuring what I do against you? Because you see, ultimately, we are working for the same boss. And regardless of what you do, just like the story with the man who had the feel and he employed everybody, the person who came at five o'clock in the morning, it was agreed upon that you get one penny. And if you came, my God, at an hour before the shop closed, you get a penny. So we don't argue over the fact that, my God, who has done the greatest amount of work. You work according to your strength. I feel like I want to take my time this morning. Verse 27. 
It is he who come after me is preferred before me, whose sandals whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. These things were done in Beth Barbara before the Jordan where John was baptized. So John is having this conversation in the region and in the region that he was having the conversation, my God, he, 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 he said to them, I am not him, but I am he, I am he who was sent before him. I am he. And watch this in 29. So the next day, the next day, John saw Jesus coming. So notice, if you will, the Pharisees and everybody was there. And the Bible said that the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. And look at what he said. He says now, behold, he pointed him out with the finger. He pointed him out with the finger. He pointed him out with the finger and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who take it away, the sin of the world. This, my God, is he whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he, my God, was before me. I did not know him, good God, but that he, my God, should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing my God with water. And John bore witness saying, good God, I saw. No, 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 let me just stop here. Let me just stop here. Point him out with the finger. Who are you? Who are you? Spirit of the living God. Ah, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the discomfort that we feel. My God in the service, when the question is asked, who are you? For some of us, we don't know. For some of us, we think we know. And for some of us, we have acted in a way and in a manner which we think we know who we are. But God, when we do, we find that there is still something deep down on the inside, questioning and asking, who are you? The frustration that comes to mind when we ponder this question, who are you? It's an indication, God, that yes, we need clarity and context. The blind spots in our lives, my God, need to be identified. And the gaps in our understanding, yes, God, they need to be attended to. And so we come into your presence. We come into this service. And we're praying and asking you, Lord God, have your way. Have your way this morning. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Oh, God, we look to you and we say thank you in Jesus' name. We pray, who are you? What is your brand? And what are you known for? Who are you? What is your brand, good God? And what are you known for? John the Baptist talked about Jesus being the forerunner. And he said that I've never met the man before. But the question is, how is it possible that John could know who Jesus is? Again, Jesus he's never recognized. He is revealed. So who God is has to be revealed to you. Divine revelation tells you who he is. Again, when we look at the story of Jesus, the story of Jesus is one that is very compelling. Compelling in the sense that it was declared, it was prophesied that a virgin shall be with child and the virgin shall give birth unto the Christ child. And we know the story read in the book of Luke. That an angel appear unto Mary again, and when the angel appear unto Mary, the angel went into Mary's room and said, Mary, thou art highly favor of God, and you have been chosen, good God, to give birth unto the Christ child. There which had thereby set in Mary's life on a different path, on a different trajectory, because now Mary has to care for God's promise, my God, which will, my God, manifest himself in her life as a child. And we know the story. Mary had the conversation with the angel, stating that she's going to give birth unto the Christ child. And it was revealed to her things about the child. And what was revealed to Mary, when we read the book of Luke, it says that Mary pondered those things in her heart. 
So again, we have snippets or deposits of who Jesus was based on divine revelation. So God spoke to an angel. Angels, again, there are messengers that comes directly. They're God's mouthpiece that comes and speak to us. Mary, my God, received divine revelation, letting her know who Jesus is. And she kept those things in her heart. The Bible said she pondered them and she never shared them. At this point, Mary conceiving Jesus, the only person who are persons who knew who Jesus was or knew, good God, that this was a, an opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity was Mary, my God, and Joseph. So this was the world's best kept secret, Jesus incubated in the womb of Mary. And for those of us who do not know the story, Joseph was engaged to Mary to marry her. And in the middle of all of this, Mary, my God, is pregnant. The Bible said that Joseph did not know her, did not sleep with her, did not know her in that way. But my God, all of a sudden, Joseph noticed that Ah, Mary was having morning sickness, and this complicated the issue. And Joseph, good God, ah, ah, looking at this from a distance, and he don't quite understand what this is. And you see, Joseph, like you and I, when God is doing something in and around our lives and we can't fully understand it, we move to my God conclusions that are inconclusive, devoid of a conversation with the Lord to confirm what is that good God I feel in this morning. Joseph, ah, the masses got to him and convinced him, yes. Ah, Mary is uh, fooling around with you. And Joseph, my God, listened to what the rumor mill had to say. And when he listened to what the rumor mill had to say, my God, Joseph moved in a direction, moved in a direction, my God, that was causing hurt and harm to the plan of God. And Joseph lay down to sleep and God spoke to him in a dream and said, my God, that which Mary is as conceived is from me and of the Holy Spirit. And I'm asking you, good God, if you can take your biases and what everybody has to say and put it off to the side because I need you to be a part of this. Can I trust you, good God, with trouble? In the book of Job, it says that man that is born of a woman are but a few days. And God is saying, can I trust you with this, my God? Because you see, this is trouble. Joseph, my God, put everything off to the side. And the Bible says, Said that he hid her privately so nobody would have anything to say to her. My God, and when she was hid privately, word came that her cousin Elizabeth was pregnant, six months pregnant, and she decided, good God, that I'm going to go and I'm going to go visit my cousin. Preacher, where are you going with this? John, again, what, what we just read, said he never met Jesus in the flesh, but we're going to talk about how they met. So Mary got up with Joseph and they decide we're going to go see Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Elizabeth was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. My God, and she was six months pregnant. And Mary, my God, pregnancy, good God, just started. And the Bible said that, my God, when Elizabeth, my God, met Mary, and when Mary met Elizabeth, good God, the Bible said that the baby inside of Elizabeth and Mary began to act up because the Bible said that the baby both left. So Jesus, good God, met John in the spirit. And because he met him in the spirit, he knew who he was. Mm. Take your time, take your time. So he, he met him in the spirit, did not meet him in the flesh, met him in the spirit. My God, you will know them by their spirit. So he met him in the spirit. And, 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 and that was quite disruptive because when, again, they met each other, the baby left and there was something about the meeting that caused Mary and Elizabeth, my God, to I, 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 I begin to question and begin to ask. Because again, with Elizabeth, Elizabeth was barren and could not have a child. And my, 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 Mary now having the Christ child going to see Elizabeth, that was barren, my God, and she stayed for a while and then she left talking about knowing who you are 
and my God, divine re revelation revealing to you who you are. So at this point, good God, we know that Mary and Joseph knew who Jesus was. Elizabeth, my God, and Zacharias was her husband, knew who Jesus was. The Bible said that when no good God, Mary gave birth to Jesus. She took him to the temple as it was the customs. And when she took him to the when she took him to the temple, my God, to have him blessed on the eighth day, the priest, good God, took him in his hand. And when he looked at the baby, think about this with me. Talk about Jesus is never recognized, but he's always revealed. And God has to reveal who he is to us. Can you imagine, if you will, you are in the temple? My God, and you are in the temple. And this man took your child and begin to declare unto you, this is the son of God, the child that was promised for the rise and the fall of Israel. So we see a public declaration of who Jesus is. Good God, I feel him this morning. And when it was declared Jesus was blessed, the word came, my God, that Mary should take Jesus and they should leave. Go with the Christ child because Herod is seeking to kill the child. And they run away with the child. The next thing we know or we hear in scripture about Jesus is when he was 12 years old and Mary and Joseph went to go celebrate the Passover. And when they go celebrate the Passover, Ah, and this was the day of atonement, the Passover. This is where families would gather and go to a central location. This central location is where they would go and any sins that they have committed, they would bring the sacrificial or the sacrifice that is required for those sins to be, my God, forgiven. They went and they offered up the sacrifice and on their way back home, my God, Mary, Turn around and said to Joseph, where's my baby? And Joseph saying, I thought he was with you. Mary says, stop, where is my baby? Where is my baby? And we know how it is, mother, when we are separated from our child. Yeah, 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 the best of who we are. Come on, and she says, guess what? We are. We, we need to find my child because if, if, if we don't find the child, God has trusted me, my God, with this trial. And, 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 and how do we, my God, ah, 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 do this in that we lost Jesus? Jesus is lost. And Mary says, I need to find my baby. I need to find my baby. Stop! I need to find my child. I need to find my child. I need to find my child. The lost Christ in a dying world. Have you seen him? They looked about just about everywhere. And Jesus is not seen. And Mary decided that we're going to trace our steps back. And Mary decided to go back. And when she did, she looked just about everywhere. Something said to go, no look in the temple. And when she went and she looked in the temple, my God, she saw Jesus, 12 years old, good God, sitting amongst the doctors and the lawyers and the teachers, the scribes and the Pharisees and those who have fancied themselves to be educated. My God, and the Bible said that Jesus was asking them questions which they could not understand. And they were asking questions, my God, that he was able to understand. And what perplexed them was the fact that this was a 12-year-old boy answering hard questions, my God, that they have pondered for the ages. And they asked the question, whose child is this? My God, and Mary and Joseph came and interrupted and asked him, why have you done this to us? Jesus gently reminded him, don't you know, good God, I'm about my father's business. I have an assignment that he has given unto me. I know who I am, and because I know who I am, I walk circumspectly. I walk in a particular pattern, not deviating or doing anything else. And we heard and we saw snippets of this. So again, look, if you will, with me. First, it was Mary and Joseph who knew Jesus was. Then, my God, the ring or the circle grew a little bit bigger in that Elizabeth, my God, and Zacharias now know. And then, my God, when he went, my God, to be a uh, blessed the priest, my God, and I declare openly who he was, and now we have another declaration of who Jesus was. And the next thing we know, or we hear of Jesus, 
So when he turned 30 and he took off the carpenter's apron and he decided he kissed Mary goodbye. Mom, I love you. Mom. But I got to go. The time has now come for me to go. Good God, and I need to turn this world upside down. I have three and a half years. Good God. That, my God, I need to uh, do some things. I need to gather, my God, a group of people, my God, to be able to effectively serve. I need to teach them. I need to, my God, make sure that they know who they are. I need to impart a certain way. I need to teach them how to pray. I need to teach them how to carry themselves. This is what brings us to the text now in John chapter number one. Because again, remember where John and Jesus met, they met in each other's mother's womb. So they met in the spirit and they met in the spirit. Good God, John again is the forerunner for Christ tasked with the assignment to go and to preach and to make the way clear so that when Jesus comes, he will transition, my God, into that role. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, now they come and they're asking him the question. Note again, if you will, in John chapter number one, my God, what they ask him in 19. So John chapter number one and 19. Now this was the testimony of John when the Jews, my God, sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem and they asked him the question, who are you? Who are you? And he confessed. And he did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. I'm not the Christ, but I'm the forerunner sent to do the work and to make the pathway straight up, just so that when he comes, he will transition. Watch this in 20, in 21. And my God, they ask him, what then are you Elijah? And he said, I am not, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then my God, they say unto him, who are you that we may give an answer, my God, to him who sent us? And he said to him, I am one, my God, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, my God, make the way straight for the Lord. So John knew and understand who he was. So when the question was asked of him and position and prestige was presented, John denied it. Why? Because John understood who is who John understand who his purpose was and that is my question for you when position and prestige is presented before you my god are you confident in who you are that you can continue to walk and serve in your purpose and say no to the position and the prestige John says, good God, I am none of the above. I am tasked with the assignment of preaching, making the crooked, making the way straight. Ah, why? Because he is coming. How do I know that he's coming? When, I, when we met in each other mother's womb, we had spiritual conversation and I knew him in the spirit and my God, because I knew him in the spirit, divine revelation will now tell me who he is in the flesh. And when we continue to read where we left off now in John chapter number one, my God will pick up our 31 and he says, I did not know him, watch this, but that he, my God, should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water and watch this. And John bore witness saying, I, good God, I saw in the spirit descending from the heavens like a dove and he rem my god he remained he, 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 he remained unto him my god watch this i do not know him but he who sent me to baptize with water said unto me upon upon whom you see the spirit descend and remain on him this is he my god who baptized with the spirit verse 34 it says and I have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God. We, they will know us by your character. They will know us by love. Who are you as a child of God? Is there any evidence in your life that will convince the world, my God, yes, you're a child of God. What is it about you, my God, that will 
discount or discredit any accusation that the world will have saying that you're not this but when they look at who you are good god they can say without a shadow of a doubt that this is a man of god that is a woman of god who are you do you know who you are <laughs> what is your brand <laughs> what are you known for john again he said, ah, <laughs> I have seen and have testified this day, my God, that this is the Son of God. So John again knows him, not by ah, the works or anything, but again, the spirit of Almighty God revealed to John that that is Jesus. My question to you is simply this. What will the spirit of Almighty God reveal to others about you? What? Who are you? And you see, it's not a question, my God, that the world gets to answer based on its prejudice or its bias. I'm gonna talk about a survey in a minute. Because again, you see what companies do, if they want to get a true assessment of a product that they have, one of the things that they do, they send out a survey to inquire and to get your perspective about this particular thing. What is good, bad, or indifferent about it? And the survey and what's in the survey help to my God to reshape and to remodify my God. And if they have to do some modification so the product can be better, that's what the survey is. John says, I know him not based on the survey, but I know him based on what the spirit revealed to me about. I'm gonna talk about the survey in a minute. 34, he says, I have seen him and I've testified that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples looking at Jesus, my God, and he walked and says, again, behold, the Son of God. The two disciples heard, my God, and they spake and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, my God, and seeing them following, they said unto him, what do you seek? They said unto him, Rabbi, which means teacher. My God, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And my God, they came and they saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Watch this. What I'm trying to get to here, my God, is where, yes, yes, yes. So he's going about, it has now been revealed and confirmed who Jesus is. And now the word is spreading, my God, that the Messiah, he who was promised, is now amongst us. But there are going to be some naysayers. And you need naysayers. You need people who will not trust the divine revelation that is declared over you. Why? Because of the bias and the prejudice that is locked up inside of them. I'm trying to get to verse 45, verse 44. Verse 44, let me skip. And it now says, so now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and he said unto him, watch this, we have found him who Moses in the law and also the prophet wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And when they say the son of Joseph, it's a derogatory comment because it points the finger, my God, to the suspicion that Mary, my God, went out and was cheating on Joseph. So when they said, isn't that the son of Mary or the son of Joseph, it's a derogatory comment. Watch the text. And Nathaniel said, can anything come, my God, out of Nazareth? Who are you? It has nothing to do with where you were born. But it has everything to do with God's divine revelation about who you are. Who are you? Can anything comes out of Nazareth? So you have to understand that the narrative was in the time that nothing good comes out of Nazareth. But no, you are going to tell me that the, my God, the Savior, the Christos, the Christ is born in Nazareth. It defies everything that they have been taught. But I want to say this to you, my God, based on what God has revealed unto you, you just got to keep on living. Can I take my time? Nathaniel, <laughs> Philip said, come and see. 
because know the things, the bias and the prejudice that is inside of you that will not afford you the opportunity to accept the fact that yes, the Savior is my God coming from Nazareth. Watch this in 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, one in whom there is no deceit. Watch the words of Nathaniel now, because you see, this is how you discredit the naysayers. When you understand who you are, my God, you have to just present the facts, and you can't fight against the facts. Your feelings, my God, you can feel however which way you want to feel. The facts still remain, my God, that he is the Son of God, and that has been credited and attributed to him by John, who was a prophet, and a prophet spoke on behalf of God, and he was validated by him. Jesus said to Nathaniel, come, Jesus saw Nathaniel rather coming towards him and said, Behold, a true Israelite indeed, and one whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus, good God, said unto him before Philip, my God, called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree way up yonder, and Jesus saw him and declare to him what his thought process was, who he was, what he did, what he was thinking about, what his communication was. And you see, this is what dispelled, my God, the nonsense that we have been fed. Jesus is never recognized because if Nathaniel, according to his orientation, how he grew up, how he was conditioned to think, feel, and believe about the coming of the Christ, Jesus stood before him. He did not know who he was because, my God, again, his argument and his statement was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And it took Jesus, my God, to ignore the ignorance that was coming from his mouth my God, and stood in and with the authority of his father, my God, and begin to, my God, live accordingly. My question to you is this. Are you living for the prestige or are you living with a sense of purpose? Are you living for the prestige? Oh, sorry. Are you living for the prestige or are you living with a sense of purpose. Because you see, if we are living for the prestige and the promise, our purpose will become secondary. And when we take our purpose and put it on the back burner, and it is what man has to say to us about us, dictate and determine what comes next from us, my God, we're gonna find that we're gonna be in a whole heap of trouble. Remember again, after Jesus uh, gathered his disciples, <clears throat> and again, the question that he asked them, who do men say that I am? So there's two parts to the survey. Can I take my time this morning? There are two parts to the survey. Jesus asked the question, you see, I work and my job surveys are important because it determined what my bonus look like. And when surveys go out and they come back, the feedback in the survey can mean the difference between me smiling and me being sad. Right, Kenya? <laughs> ah, bless you, Dave, Jesus. Bless you, Dave. So Jesus gathered <clears throat> his disciple. And after he walked with them for three and a half years, my God, he gathered them together and he said, I need you to fill out this survey for me. And it's two parts to it. Part number one is, who do men say that I am? And then part two, who do you say that I am? You see, the disciples, they didn't have a problem filling out part one of the survey. Because in their travels, they would hear what men had to say. And they recounted that. But you see, ultimately, <clears throat> the question that Jesus was after is, who do you say that I am? And there was a hush over the crowd. And Simon Peter, I love Peter, he jumped up. And again, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And when Jesus heard that, he applauded. And he said, Simon Peter, 
Watch this, because again, what I'm driving home is that Jesus Christ, he's never recognized. He's always revealed. And the undertone to that is, are you living according to your purpose or are you living because of the prestige, my God, and everything that comes with this? Jesus then said to Simon Peter, flesh and blood, my son, has not revealed this to you. Because again, think with me, Jesus is not recognized. Excuse me, but he is revealed. So if he's walking with these disciples and he's healing the sick, my God, he's turning water into wine. He's walking, my God, on water. He's raising people from the dead. How is it that it was only Simon and Simon Peter alone, my God, that was able to, without a shadow of a doubt, get the revelation that truly this is the Son of God? Because again, their minds were yet to be transformed because they continue to see Jesus based on their orientation and where they were from. Simon, my God, lose that. And my God, he connected with the Lord on a spiritual level. And look at Jesus's response when he said that to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And then Jesus now goes on and he said, upon this rock, I am going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter's name, it translates in the Greek to mean little rock. And the misunderstanding or the misappropriation of information is that we attribute the rock to be Peter. God cannot build this church and will not build this church on man. But the rock that Jesus was talking about was the divine revelation where it says, upon this rock, the revelation that you receive, I am going to build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the revelation of who God is and the revelation that God gives unto you. So when God speaks a word and he tells you who you are, the gates of hell will fight against that. But the only way the gates of hell win and prevail is if you come into agreement with my God, the word that my God, hell has declared. You have to stand up on the word of God and you have to begin to live accordingly. Because if you don't stand up based on divine revelation, my God, it is said that if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for everything. You got to stand up based on what God say about you. Peter revealed, thou art the son of God. Jesus said, you're right, my son, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my spirit. Are you living, my God, for the prestige, or are you living based on your God-ordained purpose? Prestige is simply this. It says it's the level of credit or respect at which one is regarded by others. So can I say that again? Prestige is the level of credit or respect at which one is regarded by others. Purpose, the reason for which something exists or is done or is made. So my question to you, and I'm taking my time this morning, are you living for the prestige and the power and everything that comes, my God, with who you are? Or are you living according to your God-ordained purpose? Can I take my time this morning? Can I take my time this morning? Understanding who you are, it's important. Because opportunities will come and present itself for you to forfeit, my God, your God-ordained purpose. And you see, it's because you know without a shadow of a doubt who you are, what you have been created to do, and what God has called you to do. My God, you can stand and you can say no to the invitation that is extended to you. Can I prove this to you in scripture? I know you're waiting and you're asking me. Well, preacher, prove it to me in scripture. Thank you. Go with me to Judges chapter number nine. I'm trying to help somebody to understand this morning. When you know who you are, you live with a sense of purpose. When you don't know who you are, you will live, my God, for the lights, the camera, the action, and the prestige, and you're going to forfeit who you are. And when you get to the later stage of your life, there is going to be nothing but regret because you have wasted your time. My mother used to say this to me as a child growing up. Ian, time lost is lost forever. 
Make hay while the sun shines. Do what you can know because you don't want to transition into the later part of your years and all you have as your companion sitting next to you is regret. Know who you are and live according to your purpose. It's divine revelation that tells you who you are. Judges, chapter number nine. Let's start at seven. Because there are going to be invitation, mom, that comes and people are going to come and they're going to invite you to want to do this and to be a part of this. But again, you've got to understand who you are. We talked about this last week and let me just fill in the blank before I read this. Remember, we talked last week in the book of uh, 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 Galatians with the story with Peter and John. Peter and J Peter, P Peter, Peter and, and, and Paul, rather, where they wanted Paul to forfeit his assignment. Remember when, my God, Paul met uh, Jesus on the Damascus Road and his name was changed from Saul to Paul. Remember when he was sitting, my God, blind on the street called Straight. It was revealed to him who he was and what his assignment was. My God, the revelation that Ananias came and confirmed is that your name will be changed from Saul to Paul. Your assignment is to preach and to teach the gospel to the Gentiles. So he know who his target audience was. It was not the Jews. Your assignment is to preach and to teach the gospel to the Gentile. And it goes on further to say, you are going to suffer for the sake of the gospel. So when he met with the other disciples, when you read the book of Galatians chapter, uh, can, I, can, can I take my time this morning? When you read the book of Galatians chapter number two, now Paul recounts how painful it was because he wanted to be accepted but in Galatians chapter number two, it tells us that, my God, he sat under keen observation of the church because they did not believe in his conversion. Why? Because man is looking on the outside, but my God, they don't realize what God has done on the inside. So you have to know without a shadow of a doubt who you are and what God has done on the inside to change and to transform your life. They are looking on him and they did not, they did not believe in his conversion. And I have a problem with this because if Ananias was sent from God to go release this man and to pronounce God's blessing over his life, why then do the church have a problem with the fact that my God, God can save him? I believe with every fiber of my being that the church was praying for this man to be changed and for his life to turn around and know the church uh, prayers have been answered and the church still did not believe in his conversion. He said for 14 years he sat down on the keen observation of the church waiting for them to extend the right hand of fellowship and my God when that was painful and he couldn't take it anymore he said it took the church another three and a half years before they extend the right hand of fellowship to him. Know who you are. And when you know who you are, you will not give into the assignment and the agenda of anybody. And they wanted him to go preach the gospel to, and he said, no, 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 no. My assignment is to preach and to teach the gospel to the Gentile. That's what God told me that I'm supposed to do. My question to you is, do you know what you have been called, created to do? And are you doing it? Because to not do it is to live in disobedience. Can I get to my text now that I need to share with you in Judges chapter number nine? In Judges chapter number nine, we'll start at seven. And it says now, now when they told Jotham, he went and stood at the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice. And he cried out and said, listen to me, you man of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Watch this. It says, so he's speaking a parable unto them. This is what I want us to see, because oftentimes when Jesus is trying to communicate to the masses, he's using a parable. Parable was just an earthly story, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning behind. Knowing who you are, this is the point that I'm driving home. It says the tree came forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. So they were in a forest, they go to the olive tree and they say, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should good God, should I cease from giving my oil, my God, which they honor God and men and go to sway other trees? You got to know who you are. Ah. Then the tree said to the fig tree, 
you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease from my sweetness and my good fruit and go and sway over, over trees? My God, then the tree said to the vine, come and reign over us. But my God, the vine said unto them, should I cease from my new vine wish, my God, cheers now both God and man and go sway over the tree. My God, then all the trees said to the bramble, come and reign over us. And the bramble said unto them, if in truth you anoint me, my God, to be king over you, then came and took, my God, the shelter and my shade. But if not, let fire come out, my God, of the bramble and the bow of the cedar of Lebanon. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Because when you understand and know who you are and you are living with a sense of purpose, you can deny and decline the invitation, my God, because of the prestige. These trees, they know who they are. And when the prestigious, my God, uh -uh, when the prestige was presented to them, come and be king over us. I'm going to read to you again the responses of the tree because, again, when you know who you are, you can decline, my God, the invitation that comes again. It says the trees came and they says, anoint my God a king over them. And the first thing they did, they came to the olive tree and look because the olive tree know who he is and understand, my God, the purpose we which and whereby it is created. It can decline the invitation. Who are you? What are you known for? What is your brand known for? But the olive tree said to them, should I cease from giving oil, my God, which honor God and man? Shall I cease? Because my purpose, my God, if I cease, if I as the olive tree ceases, my God, and give into the invitation, my God, then when kings need to be, my God, throned and oil needs to be poured upon their heads, if I walk away and accept, my God, what you're asking me to do, I'm going to forfeit my purpose. And my God, there is a chain reaction. There is a downstream effect to the decision that I make today to forfeit fit and to walk away. This is what John the Baptist was saying when they came and they asked him, are you a prophet? Are you a king? Are you a lice? He said, no, I am one, my God, that is sent. I am the forerunner of Christ. John, you, I don't want to be that because I am not that. This is what was declared about who I am and I am living in and with the sense of purpose. And how do you know that the byproduct of my action confirmed, yes, that I am of God. The olive tree said, I can't. And so they decide, let me go see if I can present this idea and get the fig tree to join in this nonsense. But I like, my God, the responses of this tree. But it says, the fig tree said unto them, should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit? Should I? Should I? When it wasn't enough, my God, they said, let us search him because maybe we can find something or someone in here to align with our agenda. And they went to the vine. The vine would have produced grape. And then the vine said to them, should I cease my God from my new wine? Which cheers both God and man. And when it wasn't enough, they said, you know, we're looking low. Maybe we need to go look a little bit lower. So they went to the bushes and the bramble and they said unto good God, even the bush and the bramble understand its purpose. They went to the bramble. The bramble say, if in truth you anoint me to be king over you, then my God, come and take the shelter and the shade. But if not, the bramble said, my purpose in this life is to ah, be consumed in fire because I give warmth and I, I, I'm able to, my God, allow the king to, my God, have a meal and all you have to know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, invitations will come and the invitation will come 
and they will reroute you from your assigned purpose. But what we read this morning in Luke, my God, chapter number 15, the story with the prodigal son. This is the emphasis, my God, that the Lord is saying, maybe this morning you're like the olive, the fig tree, the bramble, or the vine. And my God, you have forfeited. You have walked away from your purpose. My God, and the prestige and the position, the palatial palace that they presented to you. Yes, you didn't even think or you didn't even consider and you didn't even ponder that there would be some downstream effect to your decision. And you walk away and you find that, my God, you are there. Can I stay in the book and judges and just finish this out? Ah, <laughs> you walked away. And when you walked away, you're doing something, my God, that you are not called to do. And because you're doing something that you're not called to do, my God, you're not fulfilled. Let me go back to Judges chapter number six. In Judges chapter number six, this is the story with Gideon. And you see, for some of us, ah, we may have lived and we may align with the mindset or the heart of what was in biblical days in that <clears throat> if you grew up, say this was biblical days, and say my dad was a doctor, the expectation is that I should be a doctor. So when we go to Judges chapter number six, we see the story of this young man, which is called Gideon. The Bible said that Gideon was living as a farmer. And the word of the Lord came to Gideon in the middle of him, aligning with a notebook that was good. God help me this morning. Gideon was living, but the life that Gideon was living was not according to God's purpose for his life. And Gideon, like these trees, accepted my God standard that was not him and so you see when we live not according to the purpose and the established standard of God there is frustration in our hearts and the frustration that you experience it has a voice and it's trying to get your attention to say hey my God this is not who God has called you to be so the more you try to move in that direction it is the more frustrated you get and it is the more upset and it is the more annoyed you get and this is God's way of helping you to understand that maybe good God like the prodigal son you need to turn and look to me and have conversation with me so I can correct this perspective Gideon is living as a farmer the word of the Lord came to Gideon my God in Judges chapter number 6 again he's living as a farmer he has accepted that, that this is what my four parents did and this is what I'm going to do and it is in the middle of living my God based on what the unrealistic expectation is God came to him and says Gideon thou mighty man of valor what I'm a farmer why are you calling me a mighty man of valor I'm glad you're asking these questions with me because you see whenever God speaks to you he speaks to you out of your future, declaring what your future is getting ready to be and become when we live in disobedience and in confusion. He comes, my God, in the middle of Gideon's confusion and he declared to him, Gideon, the mighty man of valor. And it is a paradigm shift. It's a mind shift because all my life I've lived as a farmer and I've accepted this, but deep down on the inside, I'm frustrated. And when we don't have an outlet to voice our frustration, good God, we just live, we exist. We don't live, we just exist. We exist. And Gideon was just existing. And God now comes and assigns purpose to his life. And my God, the thing that Gideon uh, uses are the tools. And he shaped them into what? And God said to Gideon, I need you to bring the army down to the brook. Talk about divine revelation, you know, and this is what divine revelation does. It equips you, my God, to know that it is not you, but it is God. He brought the entire army down to the brook and the Lord said to him, ah, there's a war, there's a fight, there's a battle that they have to fight. 
The Lord said, you are going to be in charge. You are going to live. But God, I'm a farmer. I don't know. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. And all you need to do is to follow what I'm saying to you. Know who you are. And the Lord said, bring the army down to the brook or the stream or the river, if you will. And he said, tell every man to drink. And the Lord spoke to Gideon and says, the men who bow their heads and put their face in the water and lap like a dog. Those are the men who you're going to use to fight this battle. And when Gideon was looking and counting and telling them to step back, all Gideon was left with now was 300. <laughs> Gideon is looking at his enemy. And Gideon is looking at what he has remaining. But I want to remind somebody this morning, it's not by might, nor by power, but it's by the Spirit of Almighty God. You don't have to look at what you have because God will use the lily. You see, I like the old songs that says, little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you shall win it if you go in Jesus' name. Sometimes what God has to do is to, my God, reduce the, the crowd. Because there are some who God has uh, separated you from, good God. They would have been, my God, a thorn in your sight. So God has to come up with the apparatus in order to separate them from you. And then what God leaves you with, he's going to use that, my God, to work a miracle, my God, and to confound the wise. Gideon, under my God, the instruction of God, used 300 men to win a battle. Know who you are and know who you are in God. I didn't get to preach my text, but I preached the way he gave me to give to you. Know who you are. And when you know who you are, my God, like Jesus, when the naysayers like Nathaniel come and say, can anything good come out, my God of Nazareth? You can then say to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I met you when you were under the fig tree. Nathaniel, you were praying, you were worshiping. Nathaniel, here are the things that you were doing and you were saying. And because, my God, of his orientation, Nathaniel knew that the only way anybody can do ah, what Jesus is doing is really and truly if he is of the Son of God. Do you know who you are? Do you understand what your purpose is? Are you living according to your purpose? Or are you living because of the prestige? Like the trees that we read of in Judges chapter number nine, the invitation may have been extended for you to come and to be king. And the question is, are you at the place where you can decline the invitation, decline the prestige and the power, and walk and live in your purpose? Because I dare say this to you, here is something that we don't preach much about anymore. We don't preach about heaven. We don't preach about the judgment seat of Christ. We are and we are by every one of us, good God, will have an opportunity to sit and to kneel or to stand or to roll and wallow, my God, at the judgment seat. Because the Lord is going to ask you this question. He's going to ask me this question. What have you done or what did you do? with the life that I gave you. What did you do? Did you fulfill your purpose? Did you walk in the assignment that I gave you? Every one of us. But you know about the beauty of the judgment seat is when all oh my God, I didn't even finish talking about the survey. I apologize, I wanted to. We'll talk about the survey to next week. When the Lord asks you the question, what have you done with the life that I gave you? Do you know that we have to give an account for every words, deeds, and action that we do say and perform in this body? And this is why I need to prepare your mind. So when you get there, you will have an answer. We're going to lose the form of godliness that we have 
Because when we live in and with a form of godliness, perform and operate with a form of godliness, we deny the power thereof. We need to lose the mindset that we're going to fake it until we make it. There is no faking it until you make it. See either you are or you're not. Spirit of the living God, huh? we come before you this morning. We come before you this morning. We quiet our minds and our hearts. God, bring to her the forefront of our mind. Judges chapter number three. Cause us to reflect on the invitation that was extended to the bramble, the fig, the vine, and the olive tree. Created with their sense of purpose, knowing what they have been created to do, the invitation was extended. Come and to be king and to rule over us. Ah, and they would have pondered the question. My God, and they have a conversation with you. And you remind them of their purpose and what they have been called to do to honor God. So notice, if you will, all the trees mentioned here, the bramble, the bush, the olive, and the fig tree. They said I've been created first and foremost to honor God and then man. I'm created to honor God and then man. And if I go and become king, I'm going to forfeit that which God has called and asked me to do, and I can't do it. Keep the prestige and keep the, par the, 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 the power. And I'm going to hold on to my assigned purpose. Because I don't want to transition into the later years of my life. And it's going to be me and my companion, Mr. or Mrs. Regret. Father, my prayer this morning for us. If that's where we are, let us have one of those coming home moments like the prodigal son did. Yes, drifted and gone off. Did everything, my God, that ah, we felt was good. And this is what I wanted to do. But God, like the prodigal son living out there, he had money, but he didn't have a mission. And because he didn't have a mission, my God, wherever the wind blow him, he's like a ship without a sail. He went just about everywhere. He ended up in the pig pen. And sometimes, God, it has to take for us to hit rock bottom for the eyes of our understanding to be open. Knowing and understanding, God, yes, you've called us and you have assigned purpose to us. And when we begin to live according to our purpose, we can reject the notion, we can reject the invitation, and we can reject, my God, the opportunity, my God, they come and they lure over us, say, if you do this, this is what you will get. There is no greater reward than living according to your purpose. And when we live according to our purpose, we are going to know, know and understand that, yes, Jesus, just like you were living according to your purpose, the naysayers will come and they will have all different type of negative things to say about you. But we have to keep our focus. Why? Because there's a cross that you had to go to and you were not going to forfeit the cross because had you forfeit the cross, we wouldn't have the opportunity to fulfill our purpose. And so we thank you for the example that you live. We thank you, my God, that when the opportunity presented itself and it was challenging, you did not argue with the Pharisees nor the Sadducees. You did not argue with the Essenes. You did not argue, my God, with my God. Ah, it's going to come to me. You did not argue with them because they believed that knowledge would release them and give them the right to your heavenly father. You came 
And because your purpose was to sit with the sinners, when you sat with the sinners, they look down, my God, and they even question your purpose. They say, what manner of man is this? If he knew who that woman was, he wouldn't even let her touch. But you see, this was your purpose, my God, to cause those who were excluded to feel welcome and to know that now, therefore, there are no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And when we too live in and with our purpose, God, yes, we will go to, my God, the woman who's caught in the very act of adultery. And when she's accused, we will kneel with her. We won't say a word. We will just write on the ground. Yes, when Jairus' daughter needs to be uh, raised from the dead, my God, and uh, 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 the servant come, the, the, the soldier rather, and said, I'm a man of authority. All you have to do is to speak the word. When my God, Lazarus died, and my God, Mary and Martha are complaining, if you would have been here, he would have lived, because we live with a sense of purpose and we know who we are. We can be quiet in moments like this. This old song is coming to my mind. In moments like this, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like this, I sing out a love song to you, saying, Holly. Ale, alleluia. And God, I believe you want us to give us, give you thanks and give you praise. Because the eyes of somebody's understanding is now open to see and to know and to understand that what they read in Judges chapter number nine, my God, they're in direct violation of it. And I hear you, Lord, coming home. Yes, yeah, somebody is coming home. I was walking down the street and I wonder how far I was from God. And so I buckled up my shoes and I started to run away back home to God, running back to my purpose, to reconnect with my purpose. Reconnect. Because again, Lord, you are not recognized, you are revealed. You have revealed to us who we are. Just like you spoke to Mary about Jesus. And she had to ponder those things in our heart. Reveal to us who we are so we can ponder who we are. When you spoke to Gideon, Gideon had to work through the discomfort of what, my God, is culture and custom dictated. But he had to push it off to the side. Why? Because he was frustrated. And his frustration, my God, is what allowed him to connect with you. I pray this morning, God, for every heart that is overwhelmed, every heart that is empty every soul who do not know who they are and they have forfeited their purpose for the power and the prestige. Father, reconnect with your sons and your daughters and let this word go ahead of them. My God, and do what it needs to do in that it needs to change their hearts so they can see themselves devoided of the love and the word of God that will, my God, strengthen and encourage them. God, we come before you, and we just want to say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Who are you? What is your brand? And what are you known for? If you were to ask family, friends, or associate the question this morning. If you were to present a two-part survey, <laughs> like Jesus, and ask them, who am I? What would they say about you and your brand? And you've got to ask yourself the same question, who am I as a child of God? Am I living according to my purpose in that which God has called me to do? Because again, the judgment seat, when every one of us die and leave this earth, we're going to stand, sit, roll, wall at the judgment seat. And the Lord is going to ask you the question, what did you do with the years and the life that I gave you? Did you live according to your purpose or did you live for the power and the prestige? And my assignment, my God, is to prepare you to be able to stand and answer that question. I live for you, Lord. I live in and with my purpose. 
and I did what you called me to do and asked me to do. That's our assignment and that's our gaze. God bless you. And now may the saving grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, may the power of Almighty God get a hold of you, shake you out of where you are, and cause you to turn and to go a different way. And the different way that I'd like for you to go is the way of the Lord. Follow, trust in the Lord. David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I pray that every aspect, every area of your life will be, my God, illuminated by the word of God on the outside and on the inside. Father, we're, there is darkness. Let your word re-enter and your word now becomes light in us. Ah, so we can live according to that which you want us to do and to be and to become. Thank you, and may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may the grace of Almighty God, my God, be your guide. May the mercy of Almighty God undergird you and upkeep you. And may God's love shine ever so bright in and through and with you. God bless you, and thank you.